shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern impassion stressed a thoroughfare for freedom beat. Durness, America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self control. Thy liberty in law on the last. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities clean, undimmed by human tears. Shining sea. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you out in the Lord's house this morning. A good crowd this morning, not too many traveling, so praise the Lord. Pray for those that are. I know there's many on the road from what I've seen coming in this morning, but uh, happy Independence Day, which I know is not the fourth yet, it's the first, but uh, we won't be here on the fourth. Well, some of us will, some of us won't, but <laughs> on Wednesday. So just uh, praise the Lord for his goodness to us as a nation as he's uh, continued to work on us. I know there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, good to see you guys this morning here. As we open up in a word of prayer, of course, that's continue to remember those that's been on our prayer list. Uh, seems to be a lot going on in the church right now with uh, Brother Danny. He had his uh, operation a couple days ago. He is still in the hospital recovering. Uh, Brother Chan said this morning he had been in some pain. So just pray for him. He may come home today, but I think uh, from what I'm hearing, it may be tomorrow also. So just uh, praise the Lord that he'll be in and out pretty quick. But just pray for his recovery all the things that will be coming up in the near future for him. And, of course, continue to pray for Brother Gordon, uh, still recovering from his stroke. Uh, so just continue to pray for him. I, I think the note here said it was just slow, uh, gradual recovery. And then Miss Pat said just pray for full recovery uh, from the stroke that he has had. So just continue to remember that. Uh, I don't see Brother Jeff here this morning. Has any update on Brian? Any of the tests or anything come back or negative, positives? Uh-huh. Okay, so they found something, so just uh, pray for whatever that something may be and that they can take care of that. And also continue to pray for Mr. Dickie Blanks. Brother Larry, anything new uh, there? For okay, surgery for Friday. Okay, so that's what that is. So just pray for Miss Vicki um, as they go through this on Friday. And Miss Pat was telling me uh, Miss Sandra had called and just to mention, continue to pray for Doug Smith uh, with the, the knot, the lump that he had on his neck. They said they had removed that, and they will know something by Tuesday, I believe it was, whether or not this was cancerous or what it may have been. So just pray for Doug. Many of us know who that is, so just continue to pray for him as they go through this. And pray for Grayson this morning. Uh, he'll be preaching at, uh, excuse me, Mountain View, I get all these churches mixed up. Mountain View this morning, and after he finishes that, they're going to be taking off to Indiana, going up to Hoosier Hills for a week. So just pray for their travel and all that as they go through this. And uh, there was a friend of his that uh, he had acquaintance that he met when he was at uh, whatever church he was helping, Alliance. 
mine's gone this morning. This man's name's Nick Fields. Uh, he was having some issues with cancer and had cancer in the past, and uh, right now he's in hospice. Uh, not expecting him to live for the next day or two, so just pray for that family and that situation. They wanted Grayson to do the funeral, but uh, if he dies sometime this week, he'll be in Indiana, so won't be able to help him there. He's a little bit discouraged. He loved, he loved Nick and wanted to be help to the family, but uh, may not be able to. So just pray for the Fields family as they go through this difficult uh, time. And again, I got two here. Jason Robbins' dad for the cancer and, and all the things that he's going through. Anything else this morning before we open up in a word of prayer? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Okay. From that distance. Sunday school. Sure. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. That'd be good if we can see both of them this morning. Amen. I guess did everybody hear what she said? Okay. Uh, she said that she had talked to Pat Gordon this morning. Not Pat Gordon. <laughs> Pat Coburn. <laughs> and uh, her and uh, Brother Gordon may be able to come to church service this morning. So praise the Lord, he may be able to get out and uh, make it to service this morning. Brother Chris? Uh, Carrie was going to share a few yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, now what? Knee replacement, okay, for Terry King and then recovery from that. Josh? Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, Bobby, how's your dad? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Recovery. Huh. Say it's a rare case of pneumonia. Wow. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. Did I see another hand, Miss Pat? Yes, ma'am. I actually had that written down in front of me, but that don't always mean anything. But, yeah, I've, I hate I missed the wedding yesterday, but I praise the Lord for the union there of man and woman. And of course, that's a picture of uh, Christ and his bride. So just pray for them as they uh, go through this step, next step of life. Okay, pray for Sunday School Hour and pray for service this morning. Uh, pray for the day as people travel back and forth here and there. But uh, most of all, for those that are here, that the Spirit of God would have freedom in our hearts this morning and we're, and we're free from any kind of hindrances that would cause uh, the Spirit of God not to be able to work in our hearts this morning. All right, well, let's open up in a, in a word of prayer. And ask Brother uh, Chris this morning, will you open us in a word of prayer? Amen. Thank you for that, Brother Chris. Uh, where's our man at? Did I want Miss Joe? Oh, okay. Any missionary. I'm sorry. Oh, it's good to have you with us this morning, brother. I didn't even, didn't even see you. Uh, if you want to stand up and, and turn around, this is Salvador. Uh, what's the last name? Nava. Nava. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to have you with us this morning. Sometimes I don't see things out of this side of my eye. I'm always, I tend to be left-handed, so I look this way all the time. So but praise the Lord. Now, what was we doing? Where's, where's Brother Johnny at this morning? Where's our ushers? Oh, <laughs> 
Okay, what are we going to do, Johnny? <laughs> I don't know. Are we, are we, we going to do the offerings? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it took like there's several birthdays on our, our list this morning, and and Joseph and Janice Hughes for an anniversary, but I know they're on vacation this week. But seeing Jim Hill had a, is having a birthday today, uh, not, so just, just be mindful of that. And brother Aaron Pritchard uh, tomorrow, Deborah Bryant, and then last but not least, Pastor Troy and Miss Pat Coburn having a birthday on July the 4th. So just be mindful of all these. Don't have anything to give you guys this morning. There's nobody here that's got birthdays or anniversaries, so y'all uh, y'all go right ahead. All right, Numbers chapter 13 this morning. Was you surprised I didn't say Exodus 32? (laughs) While while you're turning there, uh, Lori looking through, uh, I don't know, what's the name of that magazine, Lori? Our Hometown Magazine. You may see that laying around in different places, but this is, sometimes they have a pretty, pretty funny little, uh, stories in there, but I'm going to read you this one here while you're turning, and, and it kind of has to do a little bit with what we talk about a lot of times in Sunday school, about our testimony, uh, how we reveal ourselves, reveal ourselves to a public, uh, but it says, the, the light turned yellow just in front of him. He did not, uh, he did the right thing, stopping at the crosswalk, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman was furious and honked her horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection, dropping her cell phone and her makeup. As she was still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up in the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. Uh, He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. It says, after a couple of hours, a policeman approached, the policeman approached the cell and opened the door. Uh, she was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake, you see. I, poured, I pulled behind you your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you, and cursing a blue streak at him. He said, I noticed that you had a bumper sticker that said, what would Jesus do? And then you had one on there that says, choose life, license plate holder. And it says, another one, it said, follow me to Sunday school, bumper sticker. And the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. So naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) Exodus... No, we're not in Exodus, we're in Numbers. See, I've, I, I, I've just got it in my brain, I can't get it out. I don't want to get it out, but here you go. Numbers 13. We had just got, we had just, Exodus 32, we're talking about the golden calf and the worship and all the things that the Israelites had been going through. Now, God has sent them away from Mount Sinai to go to uh, the promised land. Uh, as, as we look in the Exodus, Numbers 13 here, uh, gives us them coming to uh, the promised land, the entering into the promised land, not into it. Uh, and then we see their decisions as they go in and spy out the land. But as we look at this, as an overview of what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks, it's talking about trusting and following God. And this, this lesson, as we look into this, and hope we can glean from it, not because we can learn what Israel did in this situation, but what, what can we do as we live our life, as we go forward into the wondering uh, that we have in our lives. But trusting and following God is a course that we must active, actively choose. As we'll see as the Israelites went into the promise, or the spies went into the promised land, they had to actively choose to trust in God. Often it's not easy or most convenient way nor is it the way that looks the most promising to the unspiritual eye. Yet it is in faith-filled obedience 
that we triumph over obstacles and enter into the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. When we walk by sight, we forfeit the benefits of walking by faith. Let me say that again. When we walk by sight, we forfeit the benefits of walking by faith. And this is what the Israelites, these, these spies, did. They went in and they, by their eyes, seen things they didn't like. They seen some things that they liked. They seen the fruit and all them things, and I'm getting ahead of myself. But they seen some other things that discouraged them to the point that they did, they did not trust God and what God had promised them already. He said, the land is yours. All you got to do is take it. And they didn't have the faith to do that. But some of the goals I wanted to look at here in this next few weeks is understand the need to see the obstacles through the eyes of God. We're all going to have obstacles in our life. Things are going to come up that will hinder, that will block, but understand we need to see those things through the eyes of God who has allowed those things to come up for a purpose, for us to show faith, for us to show belief in the God of heaven. That's what he desired for his people, and that's what he desires for me and you this morning. And another thing, we need to realize the influence that our attitudes have on the people around us. And as we'll see, as these Israelites, these ten spies who had a bad report, how it affected all those around them. And how the same thing, when we go through obstacles in our life and troubles and trials and tribulations, and there's myriads of trials and tribulations in this, in this room today, but how do we handle those when we portray a poor mouth or a bad mouth or, or woe is me, why is God doing this to me thing to the people around us? Hey, don't, but don't eat in your mind that that don't affect other people. It affects you, it affects your family, it affects those around us. So we want, to, we want to look at that and also decide to be an encouragement in the lives of those of other people in our lives, for yourself, for those, and the people around us. Now we're going to have a somewhat of an extended lengthy read here because we're going to read uh, chapter 13 in its entirety except for uh, all the different names of the different men that, that went in as, as five. So we're going to look in verse 13, but before I start there, Anybody know, anybody know who Oshia is? He is one of the men that was chosen out of the tribe of Ephraim to go in and spy out the land. Anybody know who he is? Joshua. Joshua. And we're going to see in another verse how uh, Noah, not no, Noah, we're in the wrong place here. Moses uh, calls Oshia out and calls him by his name Joshua, which Oshia was the family name for Joshua. Just a little side point here. But look in verse 1. And we see, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I have given to the children of Israel. So as you see there in verse 2, he says, I have given the land of Canaan to the children of Israel already. He says, Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were the heads of the children of Israel. So we're going to skip down to verse, I think, verse 16. We're not going to go through the names. If you're going to go back later and look at those names and the tribes they come out of, you're welcome to that. Verse 16 says, These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Joshua, Jehoshua. Is, I guess probably better of a pronunciation for what he has called him here. But in verse 17 it says, And Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Cana, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward to go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is. And the people that dwell there, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it is good or bad, and what cities that be that they dwell in, whether it is tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether uh, there be wood therein or not, and be you of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto uh, Rehob as the men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came into Hebron where uh, Ahaman, Seshua, Talma and the children of Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. 
And they came into the brook of Eschol and cut down the, hence a branch, uh, which one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eschol because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they turned from search of the land forty days, uh, from four, after forty days, and they went up and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel into the wilderness of Paran to uh, Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, uh, We came into the land whether thy, thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is a and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, which we're going to look at that word here later on, but a word that we don't necessarily, they didn't necessarily need to use here. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities were walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now, why is it that's a problem, the children of Anak? They were very large men. That's the, the line of Goliath, the giant people. And uh, Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for uh, we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land um, through which ye have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we, um, and we were in our own sights as grasshoppers, and, we, and so we were in their sight. Anybody ever not heard that story before? Excuse me. I'm sorry, did I give you the wrong chapter? Numbers 13? Numbers 13? Verse 17, about... Okay. Moses and the wilderness wandering here. In this mindset of leading others. Uh, do you realize that everybody sitting in this room is a leader? Everybody. Well, say, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a deacon. I'm not a trustee. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I'm not this or I'm not, I'm not that. You may not be a leader inside of a church, but you may be a leader inside a home. You may be a leader inside of a, a workplace. You may not be a leader at all in any of these situations, but you're leading somebody in some way all the time in our actions in our words, in our deeds, everything. We are leading in some kind. The Christian life, life is a series of times of trouble and of times of blessings. And I think we all understand that as people who have lived a life as long as we have. We have good times and we have bad times. as We see it in the lessons in the Word of God and we see it in lessons in our own life. Between these high and low moments, we experience times of waiting, of simply traveling, as we look to the Lord for what he has in store for us. As we understand in our own lives, as we look into this, as we look into our own lives, how life is. For the children of Israel, the wilderness wandering set between a time of trouble, which would be the captivity in Egypt, and a time of blessing, which was from the Egypt time to the time of going into the promised land, which was around 40 years. And as we'll see in just a minute, from the time that they come out of Egypt to this entrance into the promised land or this going in to spy out the land was about two years. So it's about two years at last between Egypt and them sending out these spies. So only two years has transpired between this time period. The passage covered in today's lesson shows us that God has a plan for us even when we are in, right, in route to a wondrous destination. And like we've talked about in the past, God has a destination for each and every one of us. And in between where our salvation starts and that ends is this what this we're going to call this wilderness wandering. Because we are in a wilderness in this world, in our society, uh, because this is not our home. Where is our home? 
our home as children of God, of course, is in heaven with our Father, with God. In between when time He, he uh, redeems us in this time where we walk in light of God's Word, when we walk in light of everything that happens to us in our life, whether it's good or bad or both in between, because we're all going to have all of it in between, just like these Israelites had. But we have to look in, in, in light of our final destination and what will our life be when we reach that destination. I'm not talking about necessarily physically, but I'm talking about spiritually. As we talked in the past, the destination that God has for us, that expected end that he has for us. How do we live our lives in light of that? There is no time that God will fail us and to guide us and no time that we are out of his watch and his care. Do we understand that? Do we understand that when we walk through these times of troubles and these trials as, as the Blanks and, and Bobby and his family and Danny and his family and the Saunders and I, mean, I could name every one of us because we all have trials and we all have issues. The report of the spies here, let's look at that. God commanded Moses to send the spies into the land and Moses did it. The purpose of this espionage was not to determine whether or not the land could or should be taken, but rather to put before the people a choice. You could call it a test maybe. Everything we go through life is in our trials and tribulations could be a test, could be a trial that we go through. How do we respond to it? How would they respond to the spies' report? Would they take this opportunity to demonstrate complete faith or would they or in fearful disobedience? And we need to understand too when we go through these things, how will we respond to them? Will we by faith trust in God and have a good testimony to those around us? Or will we, we sit back and woe is me type mindset and disgrace God and be a bad reproach on his name in our testimony as we see how Israel did, the children of Israel. In the Christian life, we too are faced with choices. We can choose to walk by faith and trust God or to walk by sight and allow our enemies and surrounding dangers to stop us from doing what God wants us to do. We see here the spies went in and they surveyed the land. They followed Moses' command. The spies went to Cana for the purpose to bring Moses a detailed report, and they did. Moses wanted to know what type of cities the enemy dwelt in, whether the land was weak or strong, heavy populated and fruitful. He also directed them to bring back a sample of the fruit of the land, which, which they did. They brought the, the, back the fruit, the grapes, the pomegranates, the figs, to show the people there God's promise that the land was fruitful was true. This, this idea of, of, of wondering, I guess is necessarily a good word for it, this searching out, and if you remember back in our own history as American in 1805, you know about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Thomas Jefferson issued this, uh, made this a command, or necessarily sent it out anyway, and it was actually called the Corps of Discovery, which is the name of the, de the, uh, the expedition here. Brother, not brother, Thomas Jefferson was the president at that time, and to find out a, a route, a water route, to the Pacific Ocean to find a way that you could get to the Pacific by water. But they did not know what they would find along the way. Jefferson, Jefferson believed that there were woolly mammoths that they would come across. And if you know what a woolly mammoth is, it's a big elephant. Jefferson also believed that there were live volcanoes. And I think he was probably right. If you get up to Yellowstone and stuff in there, I don't know that they were live at that time, but they sure are busting over now. And and that you know, reminds me, too, of what's going on in Hawaii. I mean, it's, it's rough over there. I mean, they're having a lot of issues with those volcanoes over there. And I think a lot of these things we see, uh, we, need, we need to be mindful and not look back and say, well, that's just another natural thing. God's trying to show us something. God's trying to show us something through these hurricanes, through these disasters, through these floods, through these uh, droughts and everything. He's trying to get our attention as a people, not just America, but this whole world. He's trying to get attention. He's still on the throne, and he's still in control. And just a side point there, but anyway. 
he also believed, uh, Thomas Jefferson also believed, that there was a mountain of pure salt somewhere. But they didn't find any of those. But they did find 200 new sp uh, species of plants and animals, 72 Indian tribes. They found the Rocky Mountains and Yellowstones and a few other little things like that. So they made some great discoveries in their journey looking to discover things, a route, these tribes, all these other things that they found in their journey. And you think about it, as we go in, in, in our journey, as these Israelites, they, where had they lived? They had been in Egypt for 400 years. They had never been to this area. They had never seen this area. So they wanted to go in and find out what's here. Even though God said there's a land flowing with milk and honey, and he told, he told actually Moses that at the burning bush. So this was a promise from, from years years in the past that that's what would happen. But as, as we go on our journey, we're going we're gonna to find things that we really didn't know was there if we go and look. But we've got to go out and look and be a part of our society. Be a, not, I, say, I need to take that back and say not be a part of our society, but be a part of what God has for us in our mission to do the things God has us to do. But if we sit at home, and we're going to look at this a little bit later, when we sit at home and we don't do anything, we come to church and we go home and we don't get involved, then you're just going to be stagnant. And you know what a stagnant uh, pool of water is? It's stinky and disgusting. You have something? Personally, no. It's, it's, it's Canaan, a picture of heaven. Canaan land. Yeah, you know, we've seen that. You know, Canaan land, I'm longing for you type thing. It's, it's, it's not a picture of heaven, no, I don't think. You know, it, as long as we understand what we're talking about when we say in Canaan land, Canaan land and we're desiring, we're going to, I had that written down somewhere in the next passage or two, but. No, I don't believe Canaan is a, is a picture of heaven because what happened to the Israelites when they went into Canaan land? There's battle after battle after battle. I think it's a picture of a Christian's life as he goes in, out and, and does the work of the ministry because there will be battles. There will be wars. There will be things that come across us that we won't like. We don't want those things, but that, that's what it, it is that God desires for us. So why? So we can grow, so we can learn, so we can train others. I'm talking about being leaders. If we don't know how to lead, if we don't know how to work through the problems in our life, how are we going to help anybody else through their problems? So everything we go through in life is a training process, just like it was for the Israelites here. God wanted to see how they would react. And we'll see that's not very good on some of them. The spies did as Moses told them to do, knowing that their report would be hard to believe. They brought back the visual illustration so that the children of Israel could understand the bounty of the land that God had given them. They carried one cluster of grapes between two staffs and brought pomegranates and figs as well. I, don't, I, I can't imagine, I, I don't understand a cluster of grapes having to be carried by two men on a pole. Uh, I've never seen that. I mean, I've seen big clusters of grapes, but not where half two men would have to carry it. I mean, can you imagine when the Israelites seen what it is these spies brought back with these grapes and these pomegranates and these figs, and they carried these huge grapes, whatever they were. You know where they had been? They'd been in the wilderness for two years as they left Egypt. Oh, they thought, man, that looks good. Can you imagine a huge, juicy grape to a bunch of people who've been in the desert for two years? Yeah, they had manna. God had provided for the water and the manna, but man, they remembered Egypt too. They remembered the leeks and the garlics and all those other things that we'd have talked about. Can you imagine what they thought? The spies gave their recommendations. Look in 27 again. It says in verse 27, And they, and they told him and said, We come into a land where we, we sentest, thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. After 40 days in Cana, the 12 spies came back to report to Moses and the people that they had seen and what they had thought should be done. The report here of the fruit, God had told the children of Israel that he was going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, 
as we talked about back in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8 where God had told Moses that, that what he was going to do for his people. Now the spies brought back with them grapes from Eshcol, which, that, which all that Eshcol means is just cluster. It's a cluster of grapes which confirmed their wildest hopes and dreams. It truly was going to be a wonderful place to live. One can only imagine what these grapes look like to a people who have been traveling across the arid wilderness of the Middle East, as we've already talked about. Now, the report of the people of the land. This is where this word, nevertheless, comes in. Nevertheless means cessation means this is the end. We can't go any further, guys. We're done. No further. That's what this word actually means, nevertheless. They come and said, yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. The fruit's great, beautiful. It's luscious. It's delicious. And we would enjoy it. But just stop right there. We can't go in. It says, we're done. Verse 28 says, nevertheless, the people are strong when we dwell on the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and then the Canaanites dwell in the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Now, they went through verse 29 talking about all these different ites that are in the land. Now, these were vicious people. and They were strong. They were ready to take care of their land. There were giants in the land. Now, they were all giants, no. But there was giants in the land. They saw that. They saw the hindrances that would come upon them as a people if they tried to go into that. Yeah, they, they loved those grapes. They loved the fruit. They loved the honey. They loved the milk. They loved all that. But what were they going to have to do to possess that? What kind of trouble were they going to get into by fighting these ice? These giants, they did not believe God in this aspect. When anyone goes forward, there's always going to be opposition to overcome. If you've been in the ministry, you've been in church in any time in your life, you understand if a church tries to go forward, there will be opposition. And the problem is many times is the opposition comes with in. This is where splits because... That's not what I think we ought to do. There will be opposition to overcome and spiritual enemies to conquer. I think there's one very, pro, um, I don't know, say famous, but a very large name. If I said his name, his name's John MacArthur. Just, just say that. He, he said when his ministry started, he never thought the most opposition that he'd have to come through would come through church people. He said he never thought that when he got into the ministry. But this is where we are as a, as a church. And I, it, it is a shame. But God help us in this mindset as, as we face opposition, may it not be from within. May it be from without where we understand this is where our opposition will come from. Not from within, because we petty and we bicker about the colors of things, of carpets. Now, when we're talking about doctrine, we can discuss doctrine and understand each other and see where it is you're coming from, from Scripture. We're not talking about the gospel, and then that's where we have problems. And we should have problems when it comes to differences in gospel. The gospel, there's not many gospels. There is one. There is one gospel. You either come that way or no way. But when it comes to other mindsets of doctrines, we need to understand we need to talk to each other. We need to reason with each other. Talk to each other about what it is we see in Scripture and what is it you see in Scripture that you can help me with or I can help you with. Not that we're trying to open up many different ways to heaven because there's not, but there's one way. It is usually when we are retreating or standing still going with the flow, or taking the path of least resistance that we do not have enemies. We do not meet opposition when we're in those positions. When we're sitting still, or backing up, or just not doing anything, you're going to be at ease in Zion. 
you won't have opposition. You won't have the devil worrying about you because he don't have to worry about you. You're not causing any trouble for him. <clears throat> More specifically, when people of a or a church try to advance for the cause of Christ, they can expect spiritual conflict and satanic opposition. Thankfully, God's word teaches us that the gates and the enemy shall not prevail against the momentum of God's people. Yet when we, when, we, when we butt into something sometimes as children of God, when we're trying to go forward and we get opposition from externally or whatever it may be, then we say, oh, man, this is just too hard. We're just like these Israelites when we see the goodness that God has said for his people, but yet they see what they're going to have to go through to get this. And they say, I don't think it's worth it. But God says go. He tells us to go whether you're having opposition or not. Is opposition difficult? and Is it hard? Yes, it is. But it helps us. It grows us. It makes us more mature. I, there's things in my life I wish I could take away. And then there's other, when I step over on this side, I'm glad I went through them because it's made me who I am today. If it wasn't for those opposite, if it wasn't for those trials and those tribulations, me and them are brought upon myself, I may not be standing up here doing what I'm doing today. I'm not doing anything great or spectacular, no more than you can do. But it's through these things that we grow. Thankfully, God's word teaches us again that gates of hell will not prevail against us, which Matthew 16, 18 tells us that. We go into the New Testament, it says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, he was not telling us, me and you today, that Peter is the rock which he's building his church upon. That's what Catholics say. No, you got to read the verses before it to tell what it is he's building his church on. He's building upon the name of Jesus Christ and who he is. That's what he's building his church upon. And when he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it, what does that imply? It means that it implies that the hell is trying to hinder that, that there will be opposition. But he says it's not going to rule over, he's not going to destroy the church of the living God. Verse 30 says, when Caleb gave the report of the land, he had a whole different mindset. His mindset was God-focused, not sight-focused. Let's see what verse 30 says. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Wow, what a spirit that Caleb had in him. It says, He believed God, and challenge the people to go forward. And that's what leadership does. Whether it's in you being that leadership in your surroundings, or the pastor in his leadership, or whatever leadership we're talking about, it is a building up, and it is an encouraging to trust in God. To understand that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. To understand that God is who he says he is. His simple challenge to go up and possess it is a call for us as Christians today. We need to go out and, and possess what it is that God has promised for us. I'm not talking about big houses. I'm not talking about cleef load dollar garbage. I'm not talking about Joe Olstein mess. I'm not talking about the TCT guys that are out there to go out and possess their jets and their planes and all the things they think they have to have for ministry, fleecing the people like they do. And I'm talking about spiritually speaking, going out and and seeing people saved, building up the ministry, growing your local church, helping your local church, being a part of that. We are able to experience victory, guys. And I think sometimes we as, as church people just sit back and are just satisfied in defeat. And not necessarily being defeated necessarily, but just not doing nothing. Not doing anything much at all. And I'm not necessarily talking about individuals. Y'all y'all do what y'all do in, in your life and you, you minister in the way you do. I don't know what you do. I'm not around y'all day. You don't know what I do. But we need to be focused on what it is that God has us to be doing. He says, go out and preach the gospel. Was that the first or the second one? That was the second one. We are still on the winning side. I think there's a song that says the winning side, doesn't it? We're still there. When we sing that, we need to understand that we're on God's side. So we're on the winning side. 
Satan doesn't have dominion over us. God has dominion over us. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, then do we believe that? And we talked about last week about the, the Proverbs verse, about how we can have it memorized, but it's no reality to us. It's just like this, this verse in, in John. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Do we understand that? Do we believe that? Do we cleave to that? It says, while Caleb was filled with faith, other spies were full of fear. Ten of the spies concentrated their report on the enemies of the land, the powerful tribes of all these ites. They undoubtedly would defend themselves. Furthermore, there were giants in the land, and as often happens with fear, the size of the enemy was exaggerated. You know what the verse says? He says, we're as grasshoppers in their sights. Now, were they as grasshoppers in their sights? No. Now, if, Chris, you had a grasshopper at your feet, in the difference in the comparison, no. The, the size of the enemy was not that great. Now, David, when he slew Goliath, he figured that was about four foot difference. Now, there's a huge difference between four foot and the grasshopper size. So when we get fearful, we over-exaggerate the problems many times. And we look at them in a huge, greater way because we're not having our faith and our sight on who Jesus is and who God is, is who is the one who has told us to go. The spies concluded we are as grasshoppers in their sights. And while Goliath was four foot taller, I just said that so I won't reread it. He says, we are able to go up against his people for they are stronger than we. We are not able to. Which is fear. Which was fear in the eyes of God's people who had showed them so many, so many signs, so much he had showed them in two, these two years. From Egypt, from the plagues. Can you imagine seeing those? You've just seen those. you just come to the Red Sea. And God destroyed the whole Egyptian army in front of you. You were standing there by the, the brink of the lake, the river, or the ocean, excuse me, the sea. And you've seen God close in the water all around him and destroy them. You've seen a God who was leading you by fire in the, in the morning and at night, a pillar of cloud of fire and all that. You've seen God working, feeding you through this desert, giving you water through this desert, protecting you from the enemies around you in this desert. But yet when they come to this land that God says it's yours, go get it. They said, we can't. We don't have a God big enough to help us. That's what they said. You know, you don't show it in Scripture, but that's what they said. So as we stop here, let's just, let's just think about this idea of these, these children of Israel. God commanded them to do something. And because of fear, they didn't. And we're going to see, we're going to see uh, there is punishment for that, guys. <laughs> As children of God, God wants to move us and direct us in a certain direction. When we don't, he may have to use chastisement as he used here in these people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your direction. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your word, Lord. Um, I can't say that enough and many times, Lord. Thank you for it. I ask that you would just help us, Lord, as, as, we, as we do battle. Lord, and this life is a life of battle. Lord, help us to be strong, understanding who you are in our lives and what you have commanded us to do. And God, help us to live in that and to grow in that as we have defeats and, Lord, as we have victories. Lord, it's a growing process. And we'll thank you for what's done.